Thank you. Well, it's a huge pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, if someone had suggested to me three years ago that uh, I would be speaking at FOSDEM, um, that I'd be representing Sun, that I'd be talking about Java being under the GPL, I would probably have laughed almost as loudly as you would have done. Um, so, uh, it's, it's really quite awesome to be here talking about this for you today. What I'm going to try and do for you is try and be as interesting as I can by not talking for too long and getting some other interesting people up here. What I'd like to do is start off by talking to you about why Sun is interested in free software, then talk to you a little bit about um, the Java platform and free software, and introduce you to some of the people who are making it happen, and then we'll go have lunch. Um, does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I don't know if you've, if you've thought about the, the impact that the, uh, the internet has had on society. Uh, this is, if you're used to my presentations, you know, I, I use million dollar graphics for everything that I'm doing here. So, the, the structure of society for decades has been a structure which has been hub and spoke. It's been government in the middle with citizens out at the spokes having things done to them. It's been um, consumers, the consumer society. I always think is a wonderful phrase. Uh, it brings to me a lovely um, Belgian idea of geese having corn forced down their throats, ready to be turned into foie gras. Uh, that's the consumer society. And that, that's all part of this hub and spoke world, with people doing things controllingly in the middle and giving them out to people out of the spokes. And when uh, the internet became a pervasive and necessary part of Western life, this model changed. It was no longer the case that everyone was distributed out at the end of spokes. Instead, everyone was joined to everyone else. And that began to change everything. Now, um, Sun and the Free Software Foundation had both been working with free software for a very, very long time. If I told you about a startup company in California, that used a free operating system together with commodity hardware to uh, introduce a computer technology that completely changed the computer industry. You might think I was talking about something that happened in the, in the mid to late 90s. But actually I'm referring to the work of Bill Joy and Vinod Kosler, Andy, Andy Bechtelsheim and Scott McNeely in the early 80s. They took BSD Unix and combined it with off-the-shelf Motorola hardware to produce the workstation category, completely disrupting the monopolistic business of the big computer companies of the time. And that's been sung for the last 25 years, is doing, the, doing that stuff. And uh, right at the heart of what we've been doing has been this shift to a networked society. And the Free Software Foundation has been doing the same thing in popular culture, in developer culture, has been making sure that the ability to work is not dominated in a hub and spoke way, but is operated in a mesh way. And so, uh, with society shifting to a mesh model, it's time for things to change. It's time to head into this mesh world and to, um, uh, to, to wave goodbye to being foie gras geese. Now, I don't want to be a consumer anymore. Um, I want to be a participator. And that mesh society is what produces a participation age. The way that big software companies used to make software was by hiring all the smart people and locking them in a room and sliding pizza under the door until they had written whatever it was that needed writing and then selling tickets to get into the room. And that worked all the time that statistically you could hire some smart people. But you see, one of the things Bill Joy noticed a long time ago was you can't hire all the smart people. Some of them inevitably work somewhere else. And you know, when you have a meshed society, the people that you couldn't hire are all on the network forming a statistically significant unit. And the people you could hire statistically round to zero. And so your software business involves having none of the smart people working on software in a closed room competing against all of the smart people out on the internet producing the same kind of software faster and better. And you know, I think I know which business I would rather be in. So why is Sun getting into free software at the moment? Well, partly it's because of our history with free software. 
but also it's because we believe that the, the way that businesses do software is changing. When I got into the computer industry um, rather too long ago, um, the way that it worked was um, you bought a piece of hardware and it came with all the software you could ever possibly need. It was there on a punched tape in the bottom of the shipping crate, <clears throat> if you could find it in the, the, the huge space of the computer. And so you'd, you'd buy a computer with all the software you could possibly need and go deploy it and it would all be up and running and you would have paid for it at the time that you bought the computer. Software was paid for, the work of the labourers producing the software was compensated at the time that the, the hardware was selected. In the 80s that all changed and people started selecting software for business use separately from the computer that they were going to deploy it on. And they would then combine that software and that hardware to produce something that worked for them. And the time they pay for the software was at the time they chose it. Software companies invented this idea of a commercial license. I've never yet met anyone apart from a software manufacturer that likes selling licenses or buying licenses. No software user ever wanted to buy a software license. No, none of us wants to buy software. What we actually want is software that solves a problem for us. And what we would really rather be paying for is for having the problem solved. And with the, the rise of the mesh society, with the availability of free software being created in open source communities, we've been able to move to Software Market 3.0. In Software Market 3.0, you're able to select the software and uh, assemble a solution that works and go deploy it. And it's entirely up to you what you pay for when. You no longer have to pay in advance. And so the business of being a software vendor in the 21st century is a business that is about uh, making good software and unbundling the value proposition of software for your end users. So um, what people used to pay for was a license to get a black box they couldn't look inside. And they would have an implied right to have all of these great things down here. Some code, the ability to install it, some documentation, maybe as much as a page, you know. Um, maybe some education, maybe a warranty, uh, maybe a bit of insurance. The thing is that most of us didn't want all those things. Most of us only wanted some of those things. Well, in a world of free software, on, in a meshed society, you actually only have to worry about what you need. And you're, it's your choice what you pay for, who you hire to do things, what you buy in from vendors to do things. And so the software business of the 21st century that Sun is moving into is this software business of being able to demonstrate value to our customers and providing them with a service that they can pay for that will get their software running, doing the things they need, get the new features added, get the bugs fixed, and have them paying for just what they want to pay for. Uh, we're not doing this out of a great sense of philanthropy and love for, the, love for the world. This is just what's going to happen. Because software companies can't charge at the time of software selection anymore. Because we, collectively, have broken that business for them forever. It's no longer possible to force people to pay for software licenses. Because software is liberated and software is without charge as a result of being liberated. So, what could upset all this? I just want to briefly mention this. There's been two earlier talks. For those of you who got up late, um, there was a talk right at the beginning about software patents. And then uh, we've just had uh, Jim talking about one laptop per child. Um, on the subject of software patents, um, Sun is one of many US companies that file software patents regularly. And the reason that we file software patents regularly is the same reason that uh, Americans buy guns. Americans buy guns because Americans buy guns. <laughs> and uh, American corporations file software patents because American software corporations file software patents. If you don't, you are toast. So really we've got no choice but to file software patents. Uh, it isn't having software patents that's the problem, it's what you do with them that's the problem. And um, so uh, f one thing I want to point out to you that you really need to understand, in addition to the talk you heard earlier, is that software patents are filed in parallel with development. 
when uh, people in your community work for American software corporations, those corporations are incenting them to file patents every morning. They're not getting them to wait to the end of the process, look for the clever stuff and file patents on it. What they're doing is they're incenting them every morning when they wake up to file a patent. Uh, they're filing in parallel with development. And that means that there is a very strong chance that if you have any corporate sponsored developers in your community, that they are filing software patents on the work that you are using in that community. And you must be aware of this. It is happening in your community. The software patents are there. And uh, the reason that they are a problem is not because anyone is going to come after you personally and sue you, as, as, as you heard earlier. The problem that, is, uh, that happens there is that whole communities can be threatened by uh, a threat to key sponsors in the communities. Now, what happens with software patents is they fall into the hands of parties who would like to do things with them that are not community friendly. So let's say that I, as a company, am busily um, getting on, contributing to free software, uh, filing patents at the same time because that's what corporations do. Um, and it's, it's the same as, you know, the, the, the reason you have kitty litter is because of what cats do. Software corporations file software patents. Uh, I'm busily filing the patents. I'm unlikely to be harmful to you. Um, if, should it perish the thought, some company um, that has been filing patents go out of business, its patents are treated as assets in the open market. And the big threat to free software is what happens when the people filing in parallel in your community pass their patents to a hostile party outside your community. And that's the reason that um, the, the, we, we heard earlier that software patents aren't going to go away in the US anytime soon. And we also heard earlier that um, patents as a category in Europe are here for a while. Uh, I'm doing my, my best, as I did two years ago, uh, with Mark Webbing from Red Hat to try and stop the software patent directive in Europe. But it's like, it's like a zombie. You know, every time you look around, you find it's up out of the grave and running down to the voting booth down in the uh, European Commission. Uh, I spend my time over here trying to kill it off, but it you know, it's, it's just all keeps on coming back. So what can we do? There's three things that we can do. One of them is to accept patent grants from patent holders and hold them in common as our, in our community. Now this is good, but really low value. The reason it's really low value is because if you look at any software patent, software patents don't contain any useful information to developers. Software patents are designed to help lawyers know how to sue other companies when they infringe the patent. So a software patent is a list of things that you can have by which you can know that someone is worth suing. There's no code samples in there, the flow diagrams are lame, the language is arcane, the patents are worthless. Trust me, I've read lots of them. So um, patent grants are great, and I'm really grateful for the companies that have protected things like Samba with patent grants, but it's insufficient. What we actually need are two things. We need new software licenses like the GPL v3 that have strong language to handle patents in them. And we need to have a, a new approach to software standards that makes sure that if you implement a software standard like MP3, it's impossible for any party to prosecute a patent claim against that international standard. Those are the two things that we need to do. And I'd encourage you, in your hatred for software patents, which I share with you, to drive it into a positive treatment of the software patents. Try and prevent applicability of patents in key areas. Okay, that's my advertisement for the day. Now, back to a quiz for you. Um, here's a quiz. Uh, if you were to look at the source code in the Debian source code repository, which company do you think you would find had written the majority of the code in the Debian source code repository? Any ideas? Is it IBM? Is it, is it Red, Red Hat? Is it SCO? <laughs> Well, um, as it turns out, SCO is number five on the list. Um, uh, it turns out that Sun is actually the majority corporate contributor to the software that's in the Debian repository. Um, and uh, Sun has contributed three times as much code as IBM and five times as much as Red Hat. Uh, this is from a recent European Commission survey. And so the question remains, why do you hate us?
I, just to give you some examples of what that code is, this isn't, this isn't stuff that you don't want to use. This is stuff you're using every day. This is the accessibility framework in GNOME. This is Orca. This is the on-screen keyboard. This is the framework that IBM has then re-implemented as iAccessible 2 on Windows. This is the internationalization code in Mozilla. This is OpenOffice.org. It's actually stuff... <laughs> All the people who wrote OpenOffice work for some. Trust me, I went and met them in Hamburg this week. <laughs> um, so, uh, it, it strikes me that what's been going on for many years is there's been two ribbons of free software. There's been a ribbon of free software that has been going on in the commercial world, and there's been a ribbon of free software that's been going on in the collective world that is represented here at FOSDEM. And so, um, uh, I'd encourage you to look beneath competitive behaviours at the actual behaviours of developers. I've got a bunch of developers that have come to FOSDEM this time to tell you about what they're working on, like OpenJDK. Um, I encourage you to go, go meet them and discover that whatever the competitive postures and the stupid messages executives give out, um, actually there's real developers contributing real code and they're people who have already changed your life. Um, now, just to seal the, the two ribbons that are coming up, I'm announcing now, you know, now, yes, I'm, uh, that uh, Sun has become a patron of the Free Software Foundation. Um, I, I think it's time for us to begin to tie off the ribbons of uh, hostility between the old BSD worlds and the old GPL worlds and begin to realize that we have a great deal to gain by being united and working together. And I think that's the message that lies behind uh, the Open JDK. So let me um, show you a video here about uh, Java. <laughs> I'd love you to hear the words. The free software license. The special thing about this license is that it's a copyleft license. That is to say, all versions of the program must carry the same license. So the freedoms that the GNU GPL gives to the users must reach all the users of the program. And that's the purpose for which I wrote it. It'll be very good that the Java trap won't exist anymore. It'll be a thing of the past. That kind of problem can still exist in other areas, but it won't exist for Java anymore. I think Sun has, well, with this contribution, have contributed more than any other company to the free software community in the form of software. And it shows leadership. It's an example I hope others will follow. I want, you, I want you to get the idea here that something big has changed, okay? I, I, I couldn't imagine going to Richard's office three years ago and asking him to record a video where he said that the Java trap no longer existed and that Sun was a company that he encouraged other companies to emulate. Don't know if you could imagine that. Blew my mind completely to make that video. But something big is going on here. We're seeing a shift in society that is making it correct for software businesses to start doing free software the way that free software ought to be done. That's the change that's happening. So now to zoom in on Java for you, Java as a, uh, as a technology, as a community, has been around for uh, over a decade now. Um, when Java was introduced, it was licensed in a revolutionary way that meant that uh, businesses all over the world started to embrace it almost immediately. It wasn't licensed using a, a philosophy that was compatible with free software, but it was made available on the release day with the full source code. And I, at the time, worked for IBM rather than for Sun. And uh, in Hursley, we picked up all of the source code to Java and we ported it to AIX and to OS2 uh, by July of 1995 because all the source code was there. We didn't ask anyone's permission, we just went and did it. And uh, many, many groups all over the world did that and proved to corporate um, observers that keeping the source code secret wasn't necessarily a competitive advantage. 
And uh, that experience, I believe, was the seed that then allowed Mozilla to break through and become um, a, a commercial, uh, commercially visible free software entity. Um, now, we did that in 1995, and it succeeded far beyond Sun's expectations. Sun was just completely overwhelmed with demand. And, you know, when you're, um, when you're a pioneer, you often don't look over your shoulder to see what's behind you. You, ca you just keep on looking forward and trying to duck the arrows. And if we'd looked over our shoulder a few times, we might have realized that there was a free software constituency that we really ought to have been working with. But we didn't, and it was dumb. And it's taken a really long time to get to the place where we've realized we need to fix it. But we've realized that we need to fix it. There is a rich ecosystem already for Java that includes both commercial activities, includes free software activities, includes community activities. And it's time to bring the ribbons together on Java as well. So um, last November, I think it was, we, um, we said that we were going to GPL Java. Now, to give you an idea of what GPL in Java means in software terms, just the Java SE, the Java platform that gives you a programming environment that's the same on every platform, just that code is around about six million lines of code. That's before you've accounted for everything else. It's a great big piece of code. And it's taking some time for Mark Reinhold down here in the front row to get everything done. And so um, what we did was we started out by just releasing um, the Java C compiler and the Hotspot virtual machine. Uh, I was very thrilled when that was released to immediately see people like, um, like Mark Villard down here and Dalibor Topic, wherever he is, and up there, and Tom Tromey, picking this stuff up and compiling it and trying to break it and trying to use it to test GCJ and doing creative things with it. That immediately started happening. So Java C and Hotspot are out already. Uh, we've also taken the full uh, Java mobile and embedded platform and released that under the GPL, under the name mobile and embedded. And that's already out, that's already very active, that's already been ported to a number of new places, and um, there's a, a, an interesting free software community growing around it. Um, we're gonna carry on with these code releases over the next few months. In the spring, I think that's about as precise as I dare be, is in the spring, they will have finished um, moving all the code over into a public repository, and it will be made available uh, under the GPL with the class path exception, so that people can work on that public code base. The reason we're not just um, releasing it all at once is actually we're continuing to do business with this code. We continue to have business contracts, and uh, we're moving it from a closed repository inside Sun that's using something um, that uh, it actually predates Bitkeeper, written by the same guy called Teamware. And we're getting it out of there and into a public repository called Mercurial. And we want to make sure that we can carry on fulfilling our commitments to our customers during that transition period. So it's taking us a number of months to do it, but Mark is definitely going to get it done by the spring. Aren't you, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> He's looking very confident down here. So, so this is the timeline that we're on. Uh, we anticipate having a full buildable Java SE JDK, JDK 7, down here somewhere in the spring. Um, and uh, I'll leave you to work out where that line might actually be pointing, be, be pointing and get the slide off the screen quickly. There's a few bits of the code that are encumbered. Um, in order to, you know, when you write any piece of commercial software in a world that doesn't have free software in your, in your mindset, you sometimes go and acquire stuff from third parties. And when you acquire it, you don't think to get the right to give arbitrary, unidentified third parties the right to create uh, redistributable derivative works. I mean, no one even thinks of it, because that's not what you're, that's not what you're about. And we didn't get those rights for, in particular, um, Java 2D, the font rasterizer, the graphics rasterizer, and the color manager. And they're big, chewy pieces of software, and they're encumbered at the moment. So when the JDK comes out in the spring, it's going to have some binary plugs in it. Uh, but we want to get rid of those as fast as possible. And that's potentially where you come in. Because it may well be that, um, you know, like Sven, for example, that you've been working on a color manager. And we'd like to hear from you. We'd like you to come and join in with this community. Uh, because I believe that we can have a completely free Java in the fastest possible time if we get everyone working together on the same code base. 
Um, just to complete the picture, we've, we've got all of Java SE under the GPL in the spring. All of Java Mobile is already under the GPL. Also, all of Java EE is under the GPL. We decided we'd, um, we would add the GPL license to the existing license on Java EE so that the story was complete. Now, what this means is that you have available to you a complete stack of Java software, which is free software under the GPL that you can do anything you want with. And it stretches all the way from embeddable code for mobile devices all the way to enterprise code that you can use to program mainframes and at all points in between. The key way that this software differs from other virtual machine environments you may have seen before is, um, is in the area of Java EE. Uh, what Java EE does is it virtualizes uh, or generalizes enterprise interfaces. So when you use Java EE, you're not locked into any particular vendor of databases or message queuing systems or other enterprise facilities like you would be if you use Mono and .NET, for example. You have, an, you have an, a generalized, abstracted environment which will work with any vendor and will, will work with any free software. Okay. Yeah, JCP, yeah. Um, people asked us whether we were worried about compatibility in all this stuff. Um, the, the, one of the key selling points of the Java platform, the thing that has made sure that there are over 5 million commercial developers working with it, the thing that has made it, made it be present on 2 million devices, is the fact, sorry, 2 billion devices, is that um, uh, you can be pretty sure that the Java environment is the same in every place you find it. Inevitably, there's going to be little differences here and there, but uh, broadly speaking, the best way to get a piece of software that has a binary that runs anywhere is to use the Java platform. And it's through Java compatibility, com compatibility that that works. Compatibility is uh, ensured by testing, um, and the testing regime is going to remain in place as we move forward into the world of free Java. That's going to mean that you can use the code to do anything you want with. Um, if you want to call it Java, you'll still have to take a test. Um, we'll make that test available without charge to suitable non-profits. Um, we're going through a bit of a transition as a company at the moment, and exactly how that, like that uh, testing license works out is a tricky question for us, because we've actually got a bunch of people whose livelihoods depend on selling test kits at the moment, and we have to find new jobs for them. Um, so we, we would really be pleased if you'd um, stick with us while we find new jobs for those folks. Uh, but because in the interim phase, there's going to be a point where we can't quite do things the way that we'd like to. Okay, now I, I've, I've done lots of talking there. Um, let's uh, get some community voices in here. Uh, first, one that I'd, uh, first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, introduce you to Tom Marble. Um, Tom is uh, our son's OpenJDK ambassador, and he's nervous about coming up here. Here we go. Um, uh, uh, Tom, I... Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I did a dangerous thing, I think last year, and took Tom, yes. took Tom to DevConf in Mexico. Well, that was a lot of fun. And yeah, and, uh, and he went native. And uh, <laughs> so, and, and so we, we decided we ought to move him off his day job. You, you were doing something like, what were you doing? You, you were, you, uh, Java performance. Performance testing or something, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. performance automation. And I've been sort of doing community-related things with, uh, with Java for the past year. And um, going to DevConf was uh, a great experience. For me, and one of the things that we did uh, last year is we liberalized our license a little bit to make Java redistributable with uh, uh, distros and, and open Solaris and Linux and so on. And now, this year, of course, we're going the full way with the GPL. Yeah. So the, the, one of the you know when, when I looked at Java on free software platforms, it was in a pretty sad state, to be honest with you. Um, Sun had spent a lot of its time making it work on Windows with a, 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 an almost unhealthy focus on competing with a certain uh, northwestern American company. And, um, and we'd, we'd forgotten about the free software platforms. And we were still faithfully producing RPMs of the Java, of the JDK, uh, but um, they really, they, you needed to be a genius to install them. And uh, you needed to be a double genius to then make them run after you'd installed them. And uh, there were no packages that worked with the Debian packaging system. And um, it, was, it was really a, really a mess. 
And uh, the, the, the guys on, on uh, ClassPath and the, all the affiliated VMs were doing a, doing a bold job trying to pack, it, patch up the hole that we were leaving. But really, it was necessary to get a new packaging system together. Tom came to DevConf and sat writing it on the floor in, uh, in Mexico. Well, I, I did a little bit. I really have to uh, give most of the credit to Matthias Kloza, who is here, who did a lot of the work with Debian. So thank you, Matthias. So uh, tell, tell me, Tom, how are we getting on with OpenJDK? Is it going to be available sometime soon? I think the springtime, Simon. Yeah. For real? For real. Okay. All of it. Uh, and what are you going to do about community governance? Well, this is uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, one of the things that's really exciting about joining the free software world for Java is that now we're going to be able to collaborate. And in particular, uh, Mark Guillard and, and, and I have talked a lot about ways that we can collaborate. And Mark has a couple of sessions today on <laughs> ClassPath and the Runtime Rumble and what's coming for ClassPath. And so we're very excited to collaborate with the ClassPath community and OpenJDK and think of ways that we can grow together. So that's, that's today. And then tomorrow, we have an OpenJDK session where we're going to talk about governance. And we need your input because we want to have a governance model for OpenJDK that works for everyone and is very participatory. So we're going to have a discussion about governance tomorrow and a contribution policy. And we also have some engineers here from Java2D, Hotspot, the Java compiler and quality that are going to talk a little bit about what's cool with the, uh, each part of OpenJDK and we're really hoping that will become a lively interactive discussion on the technology that's cool that you can now access in the free world um, with OpenJDK. And then after that we have the Dev Jam where, where we have representatives from Debian, Red Hat, Gentoo, hopefully SUSE and other, other distributions to talk about packaging issues for Java on all of the distributions because once we solve the issues of packaging the JVMs, the libraries, and the applications, now Java can become an integral part of the tool chain for uh, distributions and then we can do some really exciting kinds of innovation. So that's what's coming. Great. So if, if you think we're screwing up at all, tom.marble at sun.com. Okay. <laughs> Uh, really, Please put that on uh, every website. Yeah, and if you can't remember that, ombudsman at sun.com will do just as well. Okay. I re no, seriously, if you think we're screwing up, I want to hear about it. I, I, the first time that we're screwing up, I want to hear about it at one of those email addresses, and preferably not on the front page of a website somewhere. So um, we've, we've, we've fixed a, a number of screw-ups through those email addresses over the last year, and make his life miserable if we're doing something wrong, and, and buy him beer if we're not. Um, he mentioned Mark Villard. Mark, do you want to come up and, and come talk to us? So um, Mark is one of the um, one of the the, uh, the the heroes of Free Java. Uh, there's a few others around the room actually. Um, who uh, there's, uh, Tom is hiding up there somewhere, I think. Oh, I got him he's sitting he's, there. He's, he's, he's moved down. Oh, there he is. He's moved down here. And uh, there's a few other folk. There's, uh, there's Dalibor up there. Uh, really hiding at the back, trying not to be noticed. Uh, these, these guys have kept the hope of Free Java alive through the years when Sun's management was doing its level best to be dumb. And uh, I didn't say that, of course. Uh, and um, and I, we're, we're really grateful to you for, for doing that. Um, how do you feel about uh, OpenJDK? Is it ruining your life and making you miserable? It, it takes some adapting. But luckily you didn't um, release everything yet. So... Partly, we are now in a, um, how did Sven call it? Let's steal that cookie before they give it away. So we're actually really working hard to be the first. But <coughs> then you released 1.6 and we're <laughs> one release behind again. But <laughs> um, to be honest, I think we are going to make your life a bit harder. Because um, uh, half of our work is compatibility. We, we so want to be the free thing that you can run any Java. And if the Java Java is free, then at least the compatibility part is, is taken care of. And 
then we, we, we can really compete on, on innovating things. And that, that's fun. Uh, one of the things you, you won't like is, of course, that we're certainly going to make all that run with .NET and Mono, but oh. IKCM.NET. No, but, 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 but <laughs> we, we have been doing that. And, yeah. and, and it will be fun to see can .NET, Mono be a better Java than Java. At, the, at least now there's a chance to prove that. Disprove. Or disprove it is the case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and this, the, the same with GCJ. Um, uh, we have a native code compiler. And, well, it wasn't always the fastest, but at least it was the free one. And now we also have to make it the fastest to be better. Right. Um, well, and, 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 and we, we have, uh, we, we, we are going to make sure that everything that you haven't released yet, that that will be available. We have an AWT based on GTK Plus, right. uh, uh, to the graphics based on Cairo, uh, which I think is interesting. So, um, and we're, we're, we're just going to talk and see. Well, we have a lot of things that we can learn from you already about the way that you collaborate, the way that you automate testing, the way that you, you uh, uh, do uh, all kinds of auto tools related things where you know we have our own strange and arcane <laughs> build system sorry mark uh, that is going to take some adapting to and we can learn a lot from you in that process i hope so it's about technology of programming in the last decade. The question of Java's freedom, whether it could be used freely and made part of free software projects, has been a crucial question. Sun's policy of GPLing Java, which we are celebrating now, is an extraordinary achievement in returning programming technology to that state of freely available knowledge. Sun has now GPLed hardware designs, Sun is GPL in Java. That's an extraordinary vote of confidence in this way of sharing information. And we in the free software world are very pleased and very flattered to see Sun taking its own very valuable and very important products and agreeing with us that they will be more advantageous to Sun as well as to the rest of the community if they are shared under these rules. Um, that really was everything that I wanted to say to you here today. I wanted to tell you that um, in, it's been a wild ride, certainly for me, in the last two years with Sun. Um, I believe that I, I, Sun, Sun is still a corporation, and you should never turn your back on corporations. And uh, I'm, I know you won't, so I know you're going to keep us honest. But we honestly want to work with free software because we believe that our business is best served by working with everybody in the open room rather than by trying to get everyone into a closed room. We believe that that's the future of the software business. And we believe, yes, okay, I'll admit it, we believe we'll make more money by doing free software than all those other companies are going to do by doing their closed stuff. And, well, we'd like to work with you on that. And, well, you know, I don't know how many of you are going to work on Sun's payroll. I don't know how many of you are going to be on other people's payroll. But we're moving into a future where we're able to synchronize the interests that we each have, whether they be about one laptop per child. And by the way, we didn't just randomly release the uh, open firmware for one laptop per child. OLPC actually asked me, and I released it under BSD so they could use it. And we didn't put out a press release because the only people who wanted it were them. <clears throat> just, just in case you wondered. Um, we intend to pioneer a 21st century free software business and we want to do that in a way that helps you succeed at your goals as well. So at any point that we screw up, ombudsman at sun.com, um, Tom Marble at sun.com, simon.phipps at sun.com, write to us and tell us that we're screwing up. And uh, apart from that, I look forward to collaborating and cooperating with you over the Java platform, over Mozilla, uh, over um, uh, Thunderbird and Lightning. 
uh, over all of the other packages, GNOME and so on, that we're working on together. Thank you very much for patiently listening. And we, we've got time for some questions, so don't, don't, go, don't go away, Mark. We, we have got time for some questions. And, um, uh, hey, did you, would you fancy getting that guy up there who raised his hand with the microphone? Oh. Think you can get to him? Yes. Go. Anyone down the front want to ask a question while that microphone's heading up there? Yes. Can you raise your hand again, please? Uh, my question is about dynamically typed languages. I know that the JRuby guys were hired last year by Sun. Um, what is the commitment to getting dynamically typed languages running on the JVM? And I think you better do it quickly because I think um, that Northwestern American company might be doing the same. Uh, I, I think I've noticed them hiring a few people as well, yes. Funny you should ask that because the guy whose job it is is over here in the front row. This is Mark Reinhold. He's, a, Hi. he's the chief engineer in Berlin. So, so we, we, we've definitely gone, Sun has sort of attitudinally has gone through this transition where we're, we're definitely seeing Java as two things, which is kind of what it's always been. You know, there's, there's Java the language, which is great for a bunch of stuff, and then there's Java the platform, which is the VM and all the infrastructure and the libraries. And Java the platform is about more than Java the language. Uh, so not only you know, did we hire the JRuby guys, but we're working closely with them. Uh, there's going to be a, a, a JSR, uh, already is a JSR, for a new bytecode called Invoke Dynamic, which is useless for Java. It's to to totally pointless as far as Java is concerned, but for, uh, for scripting languages or other dynamic, uh, dynamically typed languages, it can bring like an order or two magnitude performance improvement. Uh, and so we're actively working on that with the JRuby guys and other folks. So, so Java, the Java platform is definitely about a lot more than just Java language. So uh, one of the things that I started uh, 18 months ago was uh, in our NetBeans tool was support for, uh, for Groovy and for Jython. So it isn't just Ruby that we're, that we're supporting. There is one of these, it's something I've, I've, been, I've been banging on about for 10 years, five years at IBM and then five years at Sun, is that uh, there's, there's, a, like, there's a guy called um, Talksdorf who's got a website with all of the languages that run on the Java VM. There's something like 130 of them. And uh, we've finally got some to admit they exist. And um, so we are now actively working on, uh, on scripting language or dynamic languages, or indeed other, other languages that work on the Java VM. Uh, I, I'm not sure I can think of very many languages that wouldn't work on the Java VM. Question at the back. I was very pleased uh, and encouraged about the, uh, uh, your intentions and your ethical value systems that you mentioned earlier specifically in regard to Sun's patent portfolio. Um, unfortunately, I'm not convinced that uh, your intentions and values are necessarily shared by the directors of uh, Sun. And even if they are, they, are um, they have to do what their shareholders tell them. And the shareholders can change overnight. Um, is there any intention within Sun to do with the GPL equivalent to its, with its patents and that is to dedicate them to the public. <coughs> um, so that, I, that, there's not an intent to do that. The reason that we filed the patents in the first place is because we're competing against a very big um, unconvicted monopolist in the northeast of the US and a very big convicted monopolist in the northwest of the US. And those two companies, we, we need our patent portfolio in such a way that we're able to use it to defend ourselves against them and a couple of other companies. What I am keen for us to do, however, is to lock ourselves up in traps so that we can't exercise our patents against the community. So that's what uh, the patent on assert covenants are about, for example. So we've, we've made a covenant around open document format that says that whatever patents we've got, we promise you that we won't exercise them against any implementation of open document format. And that, that means that Sun and its heirs and assigns are unable to litigate against implementers or against implementations of open document format. And going forward, you'll see us make more of those non-assert covenants in areas where we're working with the community. Um, but the, the way that the patent system in the US is set up, there are no easy answers for how to both defend yourself against aggressive monopolists and unconvicted monopolists and how to also behave ethically and responsibly in a community. And ultimately, I think we need to together work out what the new, new ways of doing that are. 
Um, I, you know, I've talk, I talked a lot with the FFII folks um, 18 months ago and, going, going, and, and on from there. And really, we've still not reached an agreement about ways that, that actually work. Now, there's ways that look good, but working out ways that actually work in protecting us. I mean, we got sued by a patent troll that you'll be very familiar with, a company called Kodak. Um, they, 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 they bought a company that had bought a company that had bought a patent that uh, related to object-oriented technology. And they took out an injunction against us over Java and were threatening to stop shipment of Java to anyone anywhere in the world, which we thought was a really bad idea. But we didn't have any patents we could fight them with. And so we had to pay them $90 million so that they would get off our backs, even though we believed that their patent claim was worthless. Because in the US, they could get injunctive relief against us and stop us shipping our code. They didn't have to prove a case. They could simply say, we're going to prove a case later, so will you stop them shipping it while we prove it, please? Uh, and that's the situation we've got to, we, we have to be able to defend ourselves against. I hate it that it's that way, and I want it to change. Uh, I, m much more importantly, want to make sure it doesn't happen in this, on this continent. Because at the moment, as you heard earlier, we don't have the laws in place that make it happen here. And I really want to make sure it doesn't happen here. But in the US, I'm sorry, we, we, it would be irresponsible of us to dedicate our patents to the public domain. But I, um, I'm very keen to do responsible things in connection with our communities. Thank you. Any other questions? How are we doing? We've still got five minutes. There's one here, Simon. There's a question somewhere. Over there. Um, Tom? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Mark, would you, like to answer, would you like to repeat the question? Is there any likelihood of, of, of multiple inheritance being added to Java the language? Is that that's the question? Uh, uh, I think the answer is no. <laughs> well, a, 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 a different answer is, hey, you already have it with, with interfaces, but uh, multiple implement, implementation inheritance? Uh -huh. And another answer is, you could always write a language that ran on the VM that had it. But um, Mark, you uh, you know the, the kitchen sink language that is based on Java C. Um, would a patch be accepted in a branch for the kitchen sink language for that? Where's Peter? So we, we one of the people we brought with us is a guy who we've got a, there's a project. Oh, tell me about kitchen sink. So so. Peter van der Aha is, I guess, not here. Um, he's he's the, the Java C compiler lead at Sun. Uh, he created a, a, another project on Java.net called ksl.dev.java.net. Uh, this is actually an idea that James Gosling had. Uh, it's the kitchen sink language. So you know, we, we open source Java C, the compiler, and now people are, are taking Java C. And uh, Remy Forax is here somewhere. He's been, he's been prototyping. Uh, new syntax for declaring and accessing properties and stuff, and so so people are going wild, and it's great. Just exploring random language ideas as as the the JDK seven uh, ball gets rolling. You know what what language changes might might be considered for that. So that's what KSL is all about. Um, and it, 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 so uh, let me back up a little bit. The thing about multiple inheritance, it, it's not going to be added to Java because I, I think it's actually technically infeasible. That doesn't mean it's a bad idea of itself. It's just really, really tricky to get right, and people who have done it in programming languages so far, at least in, in, in my view, haven't gotten it right, but that's, you know, it, it, see, see me over beer or something and I'll talk more. Yes, my name is Peter Reynolds from the School Linux and Debian project, and uh, I'm really happy to be one of the people organizing the Dev Jam uh, later on. Uh, my question is that uh, when uh, Sun is missing some pieces, which is encumbered with the current Java, and Cloudspot already have one with a compatible license. Will you actually pick it from Cloudspot? Um, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know the answer to that question, but I'll let Mark tell you. Yeah. We can diff our answers. Um, we, well, let's see. I, I am not a lawyer. Uh, so th there, there's this whole contribution thing. We, we, we can't just, uh, we, we can't just pick out random code out there and, 
and, and pull it in, right? It has to be contributed. But we're, hopefully, we're, we're going to be working with all these class path folks, and, and it'll all be, all be one, one fun code party fit, filling this stuff in. So yeah, I, I hope there's plenty of opportunity for code sharing. So I'll give my answer one. But do you want to answer that as well, Mark? Is that code going to end up in OpenJDK? I'm, I, I, I'm not sure it's going into OpenJDK, but it's, it, it's, it's certain people will combine it. And uh, how precisely we, we, we figure out who is working on what is, uh, is, is, is going to be uh, interesting. And uh, of course, you. Yeah, well, that, but that, that is why we are here. And um, besides all the licensing and uh, stuff, there's the community and people being proud of their own code. I, I know I am, so um, it, it, it will take some convincing to replace my code with code somebody at some road, which can never be as good as my code. And, <laughs> Probably they have the same feeling about some of their code, so um, we, we'll work something out there. So, in essence, there's no reason why it shouldn't go in there. There are, there is a, there are a few tiny problems in that the way that the AWT in, um, in ClassPath is architected is radically different to the way that the AWT in OpenJDK is architected. And so it isn't just a matter of picking it up and throwing it in there. There is actually some heavy lifting to do to get, make it go in. I think, that's, I think that's what you told me, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is. Our, our AWT is based on GTK+, plus and GTK+, plus has some <laughs> slight changes in semantics with how things work. And uh, compatibility for some is a very big thing. So uh, uh, keeping grid back layout working is... Uh, is an interesting problem. <laughs> For all of us. <laughs> You're creeping towards me. Uh, uh, so actually, just a, a quick update. Uh, Simon's encumbrance slide was, was a little bit stale. Uh, we, ac we actually have um, resolved the color management library encumbrance by incorporating, I think it was a little CMS. Uh, so so that, that's actually done. Um, I Igor, who's sitting down here, is from the 2D team, and he's actually working on uh, integrating free type in as a replacement for the proprietary uh, font rasterizer. So if you're, if you're interested in, in, in that topic, you can talk to Igor. Uh, we're still kind of scratching our heads over the whole graphics rasterizer thing and looking at Cairo and other stuff, and, th and that's a really hard one. Um, so we'd, we'd also welcome, welcome your, your input and help there. Okay, thank you. So we're out of time. Thanks very much for uh, coming, and enjoy the conference. <laughs>